I've been reading a lot lately about early Japanese novels, and by early I mean like a thousand years old, like the tale of Genji. One of the features of these novels that made them different from literature in other parts of the world at the time was their focus on the psychological lives of their characters. While all fiction deals with situations from another person's perspective, some focus on that a lot and some barely do at all. Disney's Snow White, for example, transports you to a fairy tale world, but you never go very far into Snow White's head. In contrast, Japanese novels have a long tradition of diving deep into their characters' psychology, and this is a trait that they share with Mirai. Mirai is told almost entirely from Kuhn's perspective. We don't really know why the people around Kuhn behave the way they do. There's almost no time spent establishing their motivations. They just are, which is exactly how young children see the world. Even the movie's plot remains wholly constrained to a child's perspective. There's no concern for money or geopolitics or romance. This is a movie about craving a mother's attention and learning to ride a bike, interspersed with massively wide flights of fantasy typical for imaginative children. And let's talk about that for a minute. Did you notice that the fantasy sequences are all from Kuhn's perspective, that they could all be happening entirely inside his head? It's a fascinating idea that I don't think I've seen explored in film before. The idea of using a child's imagination not to escape from reality, but to explore it. Kuhn imagines what his parents and grandparents were like when they were younger. He imagines what Mirai will be like in the future. And in every case, doing so increases his empathy. He envisions his mother as a vulnerable child, and he imagines having fun with his sister. The sequences aren't perfectly logical because they're being invented by a little boy. This perspective permeates the film. Kuhn is itself a generic Japanese suffix for boy, and the only other named characters in the film are Mirai, whom the film points out is named for the future, and the family dog. Kuhn's parents are only ever referred to as mother and father, even in the credits. Because when you were four, how well did you know your mom's real name, right? The film even points that out in the climax. Mirai's also interesting to me in the number of moments in the film that remind me of my neighbor Totoro, actually. Very early in the film, we see that the family lives in a very modern house, not unlike the partially western-styled house in Totoro, in the sense of being very distinctive visually and architecturally. We also see that their house is built around a central tree, echoing the importance of the camphor tree in Totoro. Later on, we see Kuhn dissolve into tears while facing the camera, just like Satsuki does near the end of Totoro. And in general, Kuhn has fantastical encounters with strange uh, uh, characters in very lush environments that are overflowing with plant life. Hmm. And I think that's one of the keys to understanding Mirai. Both It and Totoro are films about children coming to grips with changes in their lives. Just as you could interpret the fantasy sequences in Totoro as the shared dreams of the two children, one can ask whether Kuhn really does experience everything we see in the film. Hasoda even lays quite a bit of groundwork to show us what might be inspiring Kuhn's fantasies. And that, I think, is one of the principal attractions of Mirai. It reminds me of classic films like Wings of Desire and It's a Wonderful Life, where fantasy is not only integral to the plot, it adds a layer of interpretation. It allows us to dig deeper, even in a film as beautiful and simply charming as Mirai.